Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see all of you on this beautiful day. My name is Michael Christie, music director of the New West Symphony, and joining me today are the four vocal soloists that are, make up the quartet uh, that is featured during Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Anne Toomey, Courtney Jameson, Casey Candabot, and Craig Irvin. The program we're going to be presenting this weekend, both in Thousand Oaks and Camp Rio, is about unity, and it's about the themes of sisterhood and brotherhood. And I thought it was particularly um, interesting to highlight that, because when people advertise and think about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the term brotherhood always comes up, a call for brotherhood. And I know of this beautiful work by L.A., based composer, Rena Esmail. She is Indian American, and her whole compositional um, thrust is about combining Indian, uh, Hindustani classical music and uh, Western classical music in the most poetic and beautiful ways, allowing the aspects of both to really come through uh, in a very organic way. But it is a piece about sisterhood. And I thought, well, I think Beethoven needs a counterpart. <laughs> and so um, that work will also feature a Hindustani soprano named Sile Oak, who will join us tomorrow. And Rena Esmail uh, will be at our performances as well. Um, but this quartet is, it's always very thrilling to have um, this kind of horsepower in Beethoven's Ninth, because not only do you have the combination of the symphony orchestra, which is large to start with, and then the chorus which is uh, over 100 members, both of the Arte Symphonic Choir and the Pepperdine University Concert Choir, all coming together. So you've got, already you're talking about 165 or so on the stage, and then you add four magnificent, magnificent soloists, and we're pushing 170 people performing their hearts out for everyone, especially with the, the calls of unity and in that case brotherhood so we have got we actually have a real treat for you today because both of them both uh sorry all of them are be singing two pieces for you today so we're going to get on to music quickly and i thought it would be fun to just give a quick have them each give a quick um biograph a biographical note and then the each has a classical uh piece and a fun piece we're going to call it uh for you and i'll let them pick which one they want to go and we are uh, being uh, shepherded by Brian Pizzone. Hello, it's great to have you here on the piano. So, Anne Toomey, we're going to start with you. Great. You want me to do both pieces? Uh, no, 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 just we're going to do, we'll do, uh, have you speak about your biography a little bit, and then you can play whatever piece great. you're interested, and then we'll come back, we'll come back around so everybody gets a, a little pause. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Hello, my name is Ann Toomey. Uh, I was born and raised outside of Detroit, Michigan, and um, been living in and outside of Chicago um, for the past seven years. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm a soprano, freelancing, moving all around. I've been working in California a little bit this month, and I'm so happy to be here joining all of you. And my first piece will be Visidarte from Tosca. Um, and if you, it's an opera that is a very serious drama um, where Tosca, the diva, soprano, she's an actual opera diva of her time. And this is a piece in the middle of the opera in which she is pleading for her freedom, for her lover's freedom, and to get away from the horrors of Scarpia. So.
so beautiful. Uh, it's amazing with the Puccini aria that uh, basically a whole lifetime of experience and emotion gets wrapped up in just these moments. It's, it's really tremendous. Often people ask, I think, in, in situations where they're um, gonna be singing in a concert environment, but are also singing and known for singing on stage, how you feel about the difference of having the orchestra behind you in a concert versus the orchestra in the pit. How does that, how does that feel in terms of your experience on stage? I mean, they are both such special experiences, and in the pit, uh, in, in, in within the show, I mean, you have so much more uh, context into the moment, into the drama, into the feeling of the character. But on stage, it has this, when you're doing a concert version, it just has this vibrancy of, in the moment, spontaneity, that um, is really special. And a sound world that is exciting for a singer. And so, um, what are you thinking about during Beethoven's Ninth? Because it is, it's a special moment, like it's all this, all of this drama happens instrumentally, chorally, and then the four of you come in and it's like the world changes. I mean, do you, do you have a characterization in mind? Or are, you, are you riding a wave that's already going? I would say I'm jumping on the train, generally. I think that's the fun thing about Beethoven 9 is the play between the chorus, the orchestra, and the soloist. We, we repeat each other, we complement each other, we work together to just eventually celebrate. Um, so it's definitely a train that I like to jump on. All right, well, let's tell another story by a Puccini. Casey Canova has, a, has a, our next uh, excerpt. Tell us a little about yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Casey Candivat. Um, if any of you were here five years ago, that was the last time I sang with the New West Symphony. Um, I, I was gonna say we should lighten the mood with soprano jokes, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, I am going to sing something from a l far lesser known uh, Puccini work called The Girl of the Golden West, La Fantula del West. Puccini tried to write a Western, um, and he wrote it in Italy, and uh, they didn't quite get it. Uh, it just, it's a, you know, the most American name he could think of was Minnie for a girl, because, you know, we all knew a Minnie probably in that period of our lives. Um, and it's, it's a very, it's a, a beautiful music, um, and it's very film score-esque. Uh, and it comes to a point where you're in a typical kind of Western situation. There's uh, a good guy and a bad guy. They both have different colored hats on. Um, and they're both like the same woman. And at this point, we're at the end uh, where he is about to be killed. And he is telling everyone there to, to tell his love, to tell Minnie uh, what to think and, and what to feel, even though he knows it's a lie, but just to kind of give her a bit of, of, bit of peace. And so that, that's why I was like, we need a joke in here, because we're going through two very serious <laughs> things. Uh, but we've got lighter fare coming, I'm, I'm, I'm told, uh, in this concert. So. The, the joke can be that Minnie makes the, the mistake of going with the tenor instead of the baritone. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. I knew he was going to start. <laughs> uh, can I tell my favorite soprano joke? It's not offensive. How many sopranos does it take to screw in a light bulb? Only one, she holds the bulb and the world revolves around her. <laughs> but how do you know when a tenor is knocking at your door? He doesn't have his key and he doesn't know when to come in. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs>
Okay, I see why she goes to the tenor. It's okay. <laughs> You know, one of the most special experiences I have as a conductor is that I get to be so close to the singers, whether we're in the concert environment or we're really actually huddled quite close to each other, but also uh, a place that no, not one person in the audience ever really gets to experience, which is the rehearsal room in an opera. And so usually the conductor is in the kind of the front of the room, in the middle, so you're kind of looking at the, what would be a simulated stage environment and the pianist is beside you, but the singers are taking, are occupying the space of that rehearsal room as if they're on stage. And sometimes you get to hear these arias <laughs> spitting this. <dissonance. laughs> and uh, it just reminded me as, as I've been just listening to the two of you so far, like, like that I am only uh, seven or eight feet from that, but also made me think to also kind of on a, on a funny, from a funny thought as well, that I would only ever make that much sound, maybe for a two or three seconds, <laughs> yelling at my child not to touch something that's gonna hurt them. Um, but the, the idea of creating that kind of stream, that fire hose of sound, how, does, how do you kind of wrap your head around the physicality of pumping out that kind of musical energy, would you say? Well, I'm going to piggyback this to your question earlier. So I find it so much easier when the orchestra is on stage with you. Because if you do it correctly, it should feel like you're just kind of riding the wave of the orchestra. Um, I, I like to sing Wagner. And Wagner, I think, does that really well. That if it fits you, and sometimes it doesn't fit. There are some pieces that just don't fit as well as others. You know, These pieces, we have to remember, were written for particular singers. And that singer is long dead, and so now we are trying to do our best to sound like those people. Um, but if you sing something, I remember, I, I was telling the story at lunch today, when I did Verdi's Requiem here with the New West Symphony, it was the first time that I went, I could sing that three times a day for 10 weeks, and I would be able to do anything I wanted. It just felt so easy. So I knew that that was a good fit, and then you just ride that wave. So do you think in that particular case, it just happened to be the key, and therefore it, your voice kind of fits naturally in that part of the scale, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it, it fit like a glove. It was well paced, you know, like, I mean, the tenor part in Beethoven's Ninth, the, all of Beethoven's Ninth for the singers, we sit for a very long time, speaking of which, I hope we don't come out to the fourth movement. Because <laughs> uh, uh, there's three whole movements before we even show up. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but, you know, we sit, uh, Craig's been telling the story of, after page 18, we don't sing again until page 55. And so, you know, sometimes you have to, to pace yourself in these pieces. You know, the, the, I have seen operas where the singers don't do it so help, uh, you know, healthfully, and they sing too much in the beginning, and by the end of the opera, they are, they are well beyond their reserve. And, the, you know, you, you should always sing uh, on your interest and never on your principle. Uh, is, is what I was taught, and I, I think that's a, that's a great way to think of it. Yeah, you know, I mean, a little bit of, little bit of principle every once in a you while. Can, you can make it back. Yeah, you know, you can make that back while you're younger and do that, you know, <laughs> do that just to, you know, that super special note add a little bit of the principle in there. But if not, if you work on the interest, you'll have a long, healthy career and pace yourself even within the night in that same kind of framework. Did any of you have a point at very early on where you made a sound and you thought, whoa, I can't believe that I can make that much sound? Even if you didn't think about it that way, but maybe you were singing in a, in a high school chorus or in university time where you just suddenly something kind of kicked in? So I would say that when, when I was really starting to study music in college, when I sang an E, when I was, so there's, a passage, which is the breaks in your voice, kind of think of it as a, a three a three gear shift or three on the three car. Uh, you're you're in first gear, then you're in second gear, then you're in third gear. Um, once I really kind of learned how to switch gears right, and and the note just hit, hit right in the pocket where it's supposed to be, the sensation of that is a fully different thing and a wonderful thing uh, that we then hope we get used to. But the one thing they don't tell you, well, they tell us, but we don't listen when we're young singers, is you know they, they teach us how to shift that gear, to use your metaphor, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not ready to do that yet. Sure. You know, your voice is a muscle, it develops, it grows. I had so many teachers explain how to hit a high note, 
until one day it magically worked and I went, wait, this is what they've all been saying for years, but it worked. My, so my story of that was I was a boy soprano and I was in high school at an all boys school singing a piece, it was called Misa Kenya and, and uh, no one knows of it, but it has a call and response. And I'd always practiced it and it was like, Gloria, you make joke. And adrenaline oh. chip kicked in and I was 15. And all of a sudden, Gloria, and, and you saw the conductor. I mean, because they had never heard that. I had never heard that. It scared the crap out of me. Um, but that was, uh, I'm convinced it was adrenaline that just made my voice break. Right. <laughs> Soprano no more. Yeah. <laughs> so the one artist that we don't hear on this, have with us on the stage is Siley Oak. Um, she lives, she's from Mumbai, and she lives in the Bay Area, and she's coming tomorrow. And um, as a Hindustani soprano, one of the things that I thought was such a special thing to learn is that, by and large, people singing in that musical tradition pick a key that fit their voice, and they sing in that key for their entire life. It's really amazing. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we should all talk to Siley about right. it when we're, yeah. <laughs> when we're together, but that is the, that is the tradition. So it's, uh, I guess it's that same thing of, at some point, one would get to a place where you feel like, oh, the key of whatever is my key. So there we go. Let's go to Courtney. Courtney Jameson, Hello. what is your key? <laughs> that is a great question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that and yeah. try some out and see what happens. Right. I like Q flat. Q flat. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. My name is Courtney Jameson, and I'm going to be singing the alto part. Technically, I am a mezzo soprano, but a lot of times as mezzos, we get dubbed with the alto part, <laughs> which is fun. It's a lot of fun um, singing a lot of alto lines growing up in high school, church choir, all of that. Um, I live in Memphis, Tennessee right now, um, and as part of my uh, job, um, because we have to do a lot of creative things, I also teach. Um, so I teach part-time at a local college, um, and then get to come out here and sing Beethoven's Ninth. So it's a lot of fun. Um, so I guess I'll go next. Why not? I'm on the mic. Uh, so I'll be singing... Um, an aria from a slightly different composer. <laughs> this is Rossini, um, who's earlier than Puccini, still of that bel canto era, but very, very different. Um, the music that he composes tends to be a little bit more light, has a lot of coloratura, which are fast moving notes, so we'll see how many I can stick into this <laughs> aria. Um, this one is called Una Voce Poco Fa from Il Barbiere di Siviglia. Um, and basically what's happening in this aria, there are two major parts. And then the first part, Rosina is talking about, yeah, come on in. Come on in, we don't fight. <laughs> uh, Rosina <laughs> is talking about her love, Lindoro, who she desperately wants to marry. Um, but unfortunately, her uh, guardian does not like him and does not want her to marry him. Uh, and so she plays along with being the obedient, um, young one who listens to her guardian, but if you cross her, she will not be so nice. This is Una Voce Poco Fa. Oh, oh, oh. 
Here about, oh, you took that note, you didn't do that one, and you moved that one. <laughs> uh, and I think it's, I think it's actually a very interesting point about um, the, the different parts of, of the repertoire that you have to sing as a mezzo, right? Because it's there aren't there aren't many things written for mezzo, especially right. in operas, especially kind of. heroines, main characters. A lot of mezzos just get kind of like. The young boys, or sometimes the old lady, or the witch. Um, so to have a, a real, you know, woman to play is great. <laughs> <laughs> and and how do you find since you're you've just started teaching as well? How do you find the conversations that you're having with young singers now about developing characters and roles, while at the same time they're trying to have that breakthrough moment in their own voices. Right, right. Not, I'm, ta I'm not talking about career breakthrough, I'm talking about like right, just technically, the epiphanies that happen. Yeah, because especially working with undergraduates, it's interesting because the voice development really starts to happen in your 20s. So we have 18 year olds and 19 year olds who come in and it's like, you just gotta be patient. Yeah. A lot of it, you know, learn the technique, keep growing in your art, and it will come, I promise you. Um, and so bouncing off of that into character, um, I really just try and encourage people to really make it their own and to be um, really independent in who they are as an artist, making sure that everyone you know, has something to say. There is a purpose to that. Um, that is something that you know, I struggled with for a while, really finding that character and being committed to that rather than just listening to people around me of the way it should be. Yeah, I was thinking about the fact that we do have the benefit and the scourge of recordings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. YouTube, you can not only see, at, uh, for, you can hear the recordings, but now you can watch and you can see how people physically characterize mm -hmm. the roles. And so I think it, what is so gratifying and wonderful when you're watching a, a great artist um, really capture the role and make it them, themselves is that it doesn't become a replay of somebody else's. So just proportionally, like when you're learning something, do you use recordings as a jump off point and then turn them off at a certain point? Do you never use recordings? What's your, what do you think is the... Yeah, I usually use it early on, but right as I'm learning the piece. I try not to listen to it too much because one of the... Um, yeah, one of the great things about being a singer is that you can mimic, but that can also be a really bad thing, <laughs> right? You can hear things and want to change your technique in order to fit that voice um, when it's not your own. Um, so I like to use it as a guide, and every once in a while I'll listen to some other artists, um, especially with pieces like that where you change what is on the page, right? You create your own cadenzas and everything, so it's great to listen for context, 
but I try not to listen too much. Fair enough. Craig. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Craig Urban. I'm originally from Waukee, Iowa, which is a small town outside of Des Moines, Iowa. And I currently live in uh, Waukee, Iowa, which is a small town outside of Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa. Uh, but about two blocks away from where I lived when I grew up there. Um, it's, I like to say it's kind of like being a professional surfer and living in Iowa. Because uh, there's not a lot of waves for me to catch in Iowa, but I'm surrounded by family. And that's a, a wonderful blessing, especially when I'm on the road six months, four to seven months a year is probably what we usually do when we're not in a global pandemic. Um, so it's, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> so it's, don't say that word. Um, so it's, it's nice to get a chance to, to come here for the first time. I'm making my, my debut with the company and my debut with the piece, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, about my, my piece, I'm, the aria I'm singing is Si Puo from Pagliacci. And actually, you'd think there's not a lot to explain because it's literally the first thing that happens, but you don't speak Italian, so let me tell you what he says. Uh, my character comes out and acknowledges the audience and says, excuse me, everyone, I don't mean to interrupt, uh, but welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce myself. I am the prologue. I have been sent out to tell you what our story is going to be about like they used to in the old days. But it's very important, the composer has told me, that I tell you it's not like it was in the old days where the, the tears you see on stage are not real. Our, our composer wrote this piece because he feels that, that men, artists, are real people and they must act like real people. So, so what you'll see on the stage comes from a place in the composer's soul where he, he, he wept as he wrote this and pulled it from, from real life. So you're going to see uh, maniacal laughter. You're going to see the fruits from, from anger and jealousy. What you're about to see on stage is real, and you get to judge what it is. But when you judge, don't, don't look at our clothes and, and see what we wear and judge us by that. Judge us by the fact that we are men and women just like you, made of flesh who bleed and feel pain. And then the, the last line he says at the end of it is, well, now that you know the story, andiamo, let's go start the show. So now that you know the story, let's start the show. Oh, 
styles and then with the music that we're going to be hearing now how how much uh, flexibility singers have to have to, to be able to execute different styles and so as we're heading into the next uh, set of music I'm just wondering with all of the different ways people are singing operatic certainly Broadway pop I mean how, how do you guys think about the way that you need to be able to sing in order to work in today's environment where there is so much different kinds of sound that people are making, if that makes sense. So I, I don't know how old any of us are up here, but I, I think some of us were around probably at the end of the, there was an era in music schools for vocalists when they were telling you, you either had to be an opera singer or a song singer or a symphonic singer, like you, Someone who did Beethoven 9 should not be doing Verite yeah, on the weekends. Yeah. You know, like that should not. And um, I'm going to be blunt here. Now we all have to be whores, basically. Uh, but <laughs> partly <laughs> because you can't have a much of a career and pay your bills just doing picking one. one. Right? It, so we, we, we all have had to. It, it goes back to the same earlier. If you have a good technique and it should be adaptable, you should be able to, and you should enjoy it. I mean, like, I love singing the heavy, I, don't, I rarely get to do a comedy. But yeah. then you asked me to do a concert of Cole Porter. I'm like, yes, when, where? Like, you know, I mean, it's, it's the fun stuff. And so you find the fun stuff that works for you, and um, you, you make it work. Now, I don't really like doing the popera stuff. Like, my, when, when popera is what I call, like, the Andrea Bocelli, the Il Volo, they make a lot more money than they uh, do. A lot more. A lot more. <laughs> but the, the sad thing is they're like, oh! You can sing just like Placido <laughs> Flamingo. Can you do time to say goodbye? And that's my grandma's voice I'm doing right now. And, and uh, I'm like, no, I don't want to. Um, so, but those songs are were written for an operatic styled voice that couldn't sing loud enough to cover the orchestra, so they used a mic, and thus Popera was born. Yeah. So Popera is taking. Actually, you know, most of it, I think, is also symphonic works that they just add a vocal line to, which is great and fun. And um, they don't always make sense with the words. No, not uh, at all. Y y y 
at all. But it's, it's okay, because it's still, I enjoy singing that stuff. Oh, I, 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 I'm actually in a, in a crossover trio group. Uh, yeah, it's called the Serenade, S-E-R-E-N-A-D-3. Uh, it's a three at the end. It's a brilliant idea, but bad in practice. Um, <laughs> but we, like, we did a, a whole Christmas album, which is spectacular. And I actually learned a lot about this stylistic choices from doing things like that, the crossover trio, uh, I have that's an Il Devo cover show uh, type of thing I do. Um, like who knows time to say goodbye or, um, or the prayer with Celine Dion. Like yeah. That, yeah, the prayer was probably one of the most famous Absolutely. early pop yes. pieces. Yes. But, okay. but I think people are, um, they're ha I mean you have to, like as a, young, as a young singer, I'm thinking, Courtney, that you're teaching these young singers who are, um, who are confronting at age 18, age 19, age 20, how, from a academic standpoint, are are people are, are people able to have those different styles baked in early enough, or it does it have to be segregated because of their voices? I'm I'm a firm believer in crossover work. This idea of being able to sing classically, but then if you want. Why not belt out a musical theater piece? Why not sing a pop song? Well, you live in Memphis. You can get a lot of country. Yeah, right, yeah, a lot of country, a lot of blues. Um, and it just, it makes us more viable as artists. Yeah. But then I think also it opens us up as humans. It gives us a lot more opportunity to kind of show who we are as a human being by having these different stylistic choices. And I think especially for young singers, it's not offered at all universities, but a lot more universities are starting to do this where you just teach the idea of vocal pedagogy and it's more stylistic choices between opera and jazz or musical theater. Which, which it should be. Because exactly. it, it's, yeah. it's, it's the same basic tech, technical idea with stylistic choices and, and paint brushes you use. Another, uh, the question you asked earlier is of a moment where you made a noise and it kind of stunned you. One of the, there was a time that I was doing a performance in this, uh, the Il Devo cover show thing I was doing, and we were doing uh, Somewhere from West Side Story. And I'm a baritone who has lots of high notes, so it's a group of four guys, they're all tenors, and they have a baritone so that it sounds good. Um, <laughs> and we were, we, we pass around solos and whatnot, and I listened to them, and they were, one of the guys was more musical theater, one of the guys was more of a, a crossover guy, I was the opera guy. Um, and listening to them to make their stylistic choices, I'm even going to just go give you an example, if you don't mind. Uh, so I, I was singing this line. He's very shy. Hey, I am. And I, I, made the, I made the stylistic choice in a performance, actually, to sing it more musical theater than opera. And like my friend Fernando like, took a double take at me. He's like, oh my god, you made that sound. And doing those different things has taught me different colors that I can use. Just for example, I think it's a... So, um, the example from an operatic style of singing this line, some, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. somehow, somewhere, we'll find a new way of living. That's, that's an operatic, more stylistic choice. Now, musical theater. Oh, who wow. yeah, yeah, I love yeah, it, yeah. yeah. So the musical theater style would be, somehow, somewhere, we'll find a new way of living. Still the same basic technique, just stylistic choices. See, baritones have to move their hands as to what's going on inside in order for it to work. That's just because, you know. Um, I, well, I, I'm glad you said the Bernstein note, because the last thing I sang here, and then I know I'll shut up, um, but was a Bernstein concert. It was five years ago. It was for Bernstein's 100th uh, birthday. Would have been 100th. And what I loved is Joe Mocheri was the guest conductor, came in, and, and uh, John Mocheri, excuse me. And John was Bernstein's assistant conductor for most of Bernstein's career. And said, like, look, he really wanted Tony to be an opera singer, but then Jerome Robbins wanted someone who could dance, and he ain't gonna find uh, a tenor who could dance like that. And so that concert really showed us, uh, I think, a true crossover of, of how to do everything from his musicals to his songs. To his, so you have to, you have to find a way to, to work it all in. I'll start with Anne. With the, with the, because you've been very patiently waiting as the comedy, as the comedy routine is going on. <laughs> um, and also you've been tolerating this, this tree, I think, which is, you've been very gracious. Um, what would you like to sing? 
Um, well, I'll just piggyback a little bit on what they were talking about. As a, as a female vocalist, it is a really separate technique, I find. Yes, breathing is the same. Yes, stamina is the same. All of those things, but the technique of belting versus singing and operatic high, it's a totally different space. Um, and I actually started singing um, jazz and pop music that's mm. and musical theater, and then I stumbled really? and fell hard into opera in college. So, um, but yeah, so I'm gonna sing uh, a jazz tune, a standard called In the S Wee Small Hours of the Morning. Oh. It's one of my favorites, so. You wanna go with my turn? I'll go with mine. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're not, they're not cute, they're not cute for the way, so. <laughs> So should we do gal guy, gal guy? Maybe? Why don't you do yours? Okay. Yours is more fitting than that one than mine is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I picked one that I thought you might know from musical theater, uh, The Impossible Dream. Um, I don't, this is the opposite of my first one where it needed explaining. <laughs> nah, this one doesn't. Chase from afar to try with your arms 
To learn a little insight into baritones. So do you all know what the baritone claw <laughs> is? Baritones are famous for as they sing, they reach out with their claw. The lesser known is the tenor claw, where we just act like the Pope and do this. It, it's because they're reaching their head up for the money. Yes, you're gonna money. Go, give me the money, give me the Feed money. Us. I'm singing, give me the money. That's what we do. <laughs> And mezzos just laugh at them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all we can do. No. They, <laughs> they knit in the corner. <laughs> exactly, we bide our time. Um, so I'll be bringing back some golden age musical theater. Um, I'll be singing If I Loved You from the musical Carousel. Circles, they go. 
So before I talk about my piece, who has not purchased a ticket yet? Is there anyone here who's not purchased? Could you get to hear all of us? And I want to give a shout out to who I think is the most important soloist in Beethoven 9, the chorus. Oh. I mean, they... <laughs> yeah, I see someone back there. Hello. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the chorus is, they sing far more than we do. And they work, they work their butts off. So they're, they're the most important soloist. But um, I'm going to sing a piece... Uh, that was made famous by someone that you're all too young to remember. His name was Mario Lanza. Uh, there was a movie called The Toast of New Orleans, which was about where Mario Lanza played a shrimp boat pilot who liked to sing, and the head of the Metropolitan Opera happened to be in the bayous of Louisiana, and here's the singing coming from a shrimp boat, and brings him first to New Orleans Opera and then to the Met, because that's how it works. And um, the song was made famous by he and Catherine Grayson, and it's called Be My Love. Oh. And I'll start it sitting down, why not? Yeah. of you and Brian Pizzone, you have been our captain, captain on this voyage. Thank you so very much. Absolutely tremendous. So I want to thank our wonderful audience here at University Village. Without folks, it's great to be with you. It's great to always uh, have your incredible enthusiasm. And for those of you watching on Instagram uh, and uh, Facebook Live, uh, Come on down to University Village. Check us out before our performances. We always give these Meet the Artist presentations um, just before our performances. Our next one will be just after Thanksgiving. We'll be presenting a uh, performance uh, performances called Winter Spectacular, featuring a wonderful, uh, well, it's a large group of, of artists. It's going to be the Los Robles Children's Choir. Switch microphones here. 
Los Robles Children's Choir, Mariachi Reyes, a wonderful Ukrainian folk dance group called Chernova Kalinya. And then we have a uh, two wonderful artists that are the headliners, uh, uh, tenor Chris Mann and Laura Osnes. And uh, so it's gonna be a great show uh, with the New West Symphony. But if you don't have a ticket yet for this weekend, you probably heard more singing uh, by this group just now than you'll hear in the Beethoven's Ninth, to be perfectly honest. We actually got paid for this and yeah. we're doing that for free. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, performances are this Saturday uh, in Thousand Oaks, 7.30, and in Camarillo, although there are only, gosh, a handful of tickets left in the Camarillo um, matinee performance, three o'clock on Sunday. But I know that those of you coming from University Village, um, many of you come on the um, shuttle service that the University Village uh, provides, which we are just so grateful for. So again, heartfelt thanks to University Village, not only for that transportation, but for the incredible hospitality welcoming us. Brian, Craig, Casey, Courtney, and Anne, thank you so much for being with us. We'll see all of you very soon, hopefully this weekend, and very soon. Thank you.